focus today, like I said, is really going to be about men. I, I, I really think that that's a song that we just sang that we could sing every Sunday in church because we need men to be men. Uh, how many of you have heard of the, the uh, Love and Respect series? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Love and Respect series. Yeah, it's good stuff. That Love and Respect series, uh, one of the main things it teaches is this idea that a man needs to be able to be a man. For the health of a marriage, for the health of a society, for the health of a church, a man needs to be able to be a man. And coming out of the 80s and 90s, there's a whole lot of teaching that was there really trying to feminize men, both in the world but especially in the church. Like there's some idea that in order for a man to really be a Christian, he needs to almost become more like a woman. He needs to be softer. He needs to be a little more fragile. He needs to be more loving. I mean, to really to, to make this man almost feminizing them. And, and look at where it's gotten us. We need men to be men. And so this message that I have for us today, really what it's going to look at is, is three men, three of my favorite men, in the Bible. And I think from each one of these men we can learn a whole bunch of stuff, but I've just picked one thing from each of them that I think that we can all take away, whether you're a man or a woman, young and old, I think something that every one of us can really be challenged. And my goal, the second point is going to be pretty challenging, I think, for some of us, but my goal is, is that we would leave with hope. Hope with what God has in store for us. So I hope you guys kind of picked that up this morning. But starting in Joshua, Joshua chapter 1. Now here's the deal with Joshua. I like to give a little bit of history so that we're all on the same page. Um, in the book of Exodus, we read about Moses leading the Israelites up out of Egypt, the Exodus out of Egypt, um, and, and all of the, the miracles, all the wonders, everything that, that God did. And then they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and they get to this place where now they're going to cross over the river into the promised land, giving, giving the Israelites what God has promised them. And Moses has been the leader up until now, but as many of you know, Moses made a mistake, and part of that punishment was God, he's not going to let him go into the promised land. Moses is going to see it, he brings him up, and he, he lets him see it, but he can't cross over. So then there's Joshua. And so Joshua has kind of been second in command. He's been around, he's been watching things. And God is asking Joshua, hey, you're going to take over for Moses. And you're going to lead these people. Now understand something. The Israelites, it's a ridiculously large group of people. I mean, there is a lot of people that make up the Israelites. That's what God is asking Joshua to do. God is asking Joshua, Joshua, you're going to take over for Moses. You're going to step into this job and you're going to take over. You guys, here's what I believe today. I believe that for all of us, but especially today, you men, I believe that God is asking every single one of us to do something. And I, be, I believe He does that every day. Now, it may not be stepping into vocational ministry. It may not be this major life change. But I believe every day God asks us to do something. Sometimes that can be scary. Let's, let's read a little bit about Joshua, and then we'll kind of keep going in this discussion. Joshua chapter 1, just a few verses, verse, uh, starting in verse 6. Jo again, God is, is kind of laying out for Joshua what he's going to expect of him here. Verse 6, he says this, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night so that you might be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Now listen, he says this, Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So this is God's charge to Joshua. Joshua, I'm going to ask you to do something. And again, you guys, I really believe this. I believe that God asks us to do things, that God guides us, that God directs us, that God challenges us. And sometimes that can be a little nerve-wracking. May I tell you, I remember when, when we were called into ministry, Melanie and I had been praying because we felt all of these things changing. We're like, man, I don't know why this is happening, but, but we're feeling these changes taking place. And so we started praying, God, if you want us to do something with this, we, we need to literally be called. Like, Pastor Mike has to call us and say, will you do this? So that was our prayer because... Man, I struggled with arrogance, I struggled with selfishness, and I didn't want that to be the motive 
behind getting into the ministry. I didn't want to be up here because of selfish motives. I wanted to be doing what I was doing because God wanted me to do it. And so we, we're just at home, and all of a sudden one day Pastor Mike calls. And he's like, hey, can you guys meet me for lunch next week? You know, we're thinking we're going to get kicked out, you know? I mean, they finally did a background check, and now they're going to kick us out of the church or something. So we go to lunch with them, and, and we're just sitting there eating, and, and, and that's where he says, hey, you know, you've been doing this, this, and this. What would you think about getting into full-time ministry and being a youth pastor? It's like, what? It's terrifying. I mean, that's scary stuff. We had no idea what the heck we were doing. We're, we're kind of, I mean, we're a mess, you know, we're us. But God was asking us to do something. And in that moment, and in those times when, when He asks us to do something, they can be very scary times. No different than God is telling Joshua, here's the deal, Moses has been doing all this, and you've been watching, and you've been doing your part, but now you're going to take over. And God is telling Joshua, you're going to lead my people to inherit all of this. Wow. That's a lot to ask of somebody, right? But God also says this. Be strong and courageous. Man, do you know one of the things that our families need? Do you know one of the things that our, our communities need? One of the things that our state, our country need? They need you to be strong and courageous. With whatever it is God is asking you to do, to be strong and courageous. Actually, jump down to verse 16. Because it, it, in, in verses 10 through 15, um, God is, or, or Joshua shares all this with some of the people. And now this is the people's response to Joshua. This is what they're asking of, of him now. Listen, they say this, Then they, the people, answered Joshua. By the people I'm talking about, the Israelites. Then they answered Joshua, Whatever you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey your words, whatever you, you may command them uh, will be put to death. So he's saying whoever rebels against you and doesn't obey you will be put to death. Now listen to what the people say. This is what the people request of Joshua, their new leader. He's, they say only be strong and courageous. They go down this list and they say, all of this that you have told us, that's cool, that's great, we'll do this. But be strong and courageous. Do you know the difference that it makes when a man, when a leader actually steps up and steps out with strength and with courage, with a boldness, with a confidence? If I find myself in a circle of people, whether it's my family, the leadership team here, just a group of friends, and we're just kind of wondering and questioning, what are we going to do? Which way do we go? If, if you make the littlest step forward with some strength, with some confidence, with that courage, it's amazing how that brings peace to that group and how they will step behind you and they will follow you. So God is coming to Joshua and God is saying to Joshua, you're going to do all this. He's asking them to do this thing. Dan, God is asking you to do something. Gabe, God is asking you to do something. Every one of us, I believe this, God is asking us to do something and do it with strength and do it with courage. And the people, our families, our children, our spouses, our wives, our, our, our significant others, our co-workers, they're saying, do it with strength. Do it with courage. Do it with confidence. Only be strong and courageous. That's, that's the thing I think that as men today, we can learn from Joshua. And you guys, it doesn't matter if he's asking you to lead a Fortune 500 company like, like Steve and Yvonne own. Right? Right, yeah, why not? It's in church. Why not? You can. It doesn't matter if he's asking you to be a CEO. It doesn't matter if he's asking you to to lead your family through a difficult time. It doesn't matter if he's asking you to just make a job shift, get into vocational ministry, to volunteer with the youth or the children's department. It doesn't mean if he's asking you to attend a Bible study. It doesn't matter. What matters is what's he asking you to do and are you willing to step out with strength, with confidence and with courage to do whatever it is he's asking you. That's what matters. Be strong and courageous so we can learn from Joshua. That's my first point. And my second is this, and this is the one that I think is a little more difficult. Turn with me to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, the second man that I want to talk about in the Bible is David. You know, when you, when, when you look at Father's Day, 
And this idea of speaking to men, Carolyn, I just wanted to kind of pick about, I thought about, let's, what are five things we can learn from David that as men we can learn from? I mean, there's just so much we can learn from David about being a man. And I, and I want you to understand, before we get into this scripture, I want you to be reminded of who David is. David is, you talking about strong and courageous, that's David. Amen? I mean, David is a man's man. David is a warrior. And, and, the, and the Bible even talks about them. They used to sing a song. In the Old Testament, it talks about them singing a song where David killed his tens of thousands. David is a warrior. David is a strong man. And, and when I picture David, it's like he's just, he's kind of a mess, you know? All the battles he's in. And, and remember the battles. He's not, he's not there with an M16. He's not, he doesn't have his AK going and all this. He's got a sword. And he is swinging his sword. He is, he is man to man, hand to hand combat, and he's swinging the sword and he's right there. This is David. This is strength. This is a warrior. This is, this is a man's man that's right there. Was David perfect? No, David wasn't perfect. Guys, I, I know this might not fit many of you, but are there any men here today that aren't perfect? There's not a single one of you. Finally. Two of you raised your hands. This is going to be a strong point in this message. <laughs> David was not perfect. Here's where we're at in this story. This Psalm 51, it's David's psalm of repentance. See, David is the king, and, and the, the Israelites, the, the soldiers, they're all off to war, and David is sitting on uh, kind of the roof of his palace, and he's just kind of bored. Do you know why? Because he wasn't doing what he should have been doing. He should have been out with the soldiers. He should have been out leading the battle. Instead, he stayed back, so he's just kind of milling about. He's, he's just kind of bored. He's walking around on the roof of his palace and, you know, I don't, checking his status and updating this and that. Yeah, kind of bored, wondering what the guys are. I mean, tweeting things, doing all this stuff. And then he notices on another rooftop down in the kingdom, he notices Bathsheba. She's down there taking a bath. I don't know why she's on the roof taking a bath. I don't know. But that's what she's doing. David notices her, and he's attracted to her. She's this beautiful woman, and, and so he goes, and they sleep together. Now, now she's married, and she gets pregnant. So David calls the husband home right away. Hey, we've got to make the timing work out right with this. They've got to come home. They've got to sleep together so that she can get pregnant so it looks like it's his. He refuses to. He sleeps outside because he says, hey, if, if, those, if, my, if my comrades, if my fellow soldiers aren't going to sleep in the comfort of their own homes, I'm not going to. So he refuses to lay with his wife. So David eventually ends up having to kill Uriah. Sends him out, makes sure he gets to the front line, and he gets killed. Bathsheba comes up. Now the prophet Nathan comes to David and says, Dude, what are you doing? Look what you did. God knows what's going on. God knows what you did. And David is just convicted. And I want to remind you of something. This is David, the mighty warrior. King David, the one with the sword. He just cuts people down and he kills these guys and he's the, the animals and I mean this is David. He's a tough guy, he's a hard man, and this is this is him. And then we get to this place, this Psalm 51, where you see his heart. Do you know the Bible says of David that this was a man after my own heart, says the Lord? Well, that's the heart I want. Anybody else? Man, I want to have a heart where when some somewhere down the road and somebody writes the book of Gabe. And Gabe, and God said of Gabe, this is a man after my own heart. I'll tell you, if that gets written anywhere about me, that's pretty cool. Amen? That's what the Bible says. And there's David, a man after my own heart. But I want to remind you, was David perfect? He wasn't perfect. But God said, now this is a man after my own heart. Is God looking for perfection? What is it about David's heart? Here's a heart after mine. What is it? And I believe as we read Psalm 51, you guys, we get to see David's heart wide open. It's filled with humility. You see, oftentimes in our culture, I believe this. We have this idea of strength and of courage and of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a warrior and a soldier. And what we do is we have that and we think, okay, that means I have to be tough. That means I can never have a weakness. I can never be humble. And, and the two end up fighting each other. I can never admit I'm wrong. I can never confess my sins because the two don't go together. When in fact, in my opinion, Dan, what I think is if you're going to be strong and you're going to be courageous and you're going to be a man, 
you can have that humility and that the two actually make each other better. Do you understand what I just said right there? Being strong and being courageous and being humble, they actually go hand in hand instead of going like this. But again, oftentimes we send the wrong message to a man. Look at what David does here. In Psalm 51, David is crying out to God. And, and, and I know this is a chunk of Scripture, and I know it's warm in here, but you guys, this psalm is so powerful. It's such a great word. So we're going to read it three times, the whole thing. <laughs> psalm 51, verse 1 says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Man, is there anybody here? Don't raise your hands, but is there anybody where that one phrase in this place, that's the cry of your heart? And I don't want to see your hands. But where the life you've lived, the mistakes you've made have created such a lack of joy and happiness in your own heart. For some of us, that right there, let me hear joy and gladness. God, let me just be happy again. There's some here, that's, that's our prayer. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquity. God, don't look on my mistakes. God, there's there are too many. Don't even look. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Now, I've been standing up here reading ink off paper. I'm reading words. And what I want to remind you is this is David. You want to talk about strong and courageous? This is David, the warrior David, King David. And this is him now. He's pouring his heart out to God, to no one else but to God. This is him and God, and that's it. And we can stand and we can read this. But how do you think this sounded when David's doing this? What do you think this looked like when David's doing this? And here's the picture I have. David has been face to face with other men with swords. I'll bet you there were scars on his face. I'll bet you his arms were cut up. I'll bet you his sides because people would try and cut him. I'll bet you he was nicked through his armor. You can, you can imagine that, the scars, the marks, the battle wounds. This is David. And I bet he was strong because those swords were heavy and the shields were heavy. And they were always, I bet his legs were like, like that. This is a man of all men, the warrior David. And, and that passion that he leads with, that passion that he rules with, that passion that he loved God with, that passion that he fought with. I believe that passion is coming out in this psalm right now. He's not reading it like I just did. And God, please don't take your spirit from me. God, don't cast me from your presence. He's not doing that. Do you know what I believe it is? I believe, like me, when I get emotional and my chin quivers. That's what I believe is going on with David. I believe his face is filled with pain and agony. I don't think he's standing there because he's talking to God. He's talking to the God that he knows created everything. He's talking to the God that he has seen rescue him from battle after battle. He's talking to the God that, that he has the deepest faith in. He's not standing there. I believe that he's down. And if he's on his knees, if not laying face down, crying out to God with that emotion and every scar, every vein popping out of his face, I bet. And he's just weeping. God, God, I'm broken before you. God, please don't take your spirit from me. God, please blot out my transgressions. God, don't look on my sin. God, don't take yourself from me. He's broken. He's filled with humility because he knows what he did is wrong. And now he's crying out to God. This, I believe, is the picture of the heart that, that is after God. This is, I believe, what they're talking about, is this picture right here. He's a man after my own heart. 
He's not perfect. He's broken. Verse 13, Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from your blood guilt, or from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do, not, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. Listen to this, verse 17. If you have your own Bible, highlight this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. You come before Him broken, He's never going to turn away from you. You come before Him in pieces. He, he's not looking for all of this. He wants this. When we talk about the fact that in worship, God is after our hearts, I'll tell you what, anybody can make this look good. A stranger off the street can walk into a church and make it look beautiful. Amen? Hands high, voice loud. Man, we can make it look as perfect. But what God's after is that broken heart. As a man, to have the humility to be humble to the point where we're able to say, God, I'm a mess. And I don't want to lose you. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. And then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Friends, here's what I believe is this, is I believe that we all make mistakes, but there's way too many of us, especially as men, because we have pride. And we ought to be. We're men. Our, our pride ought to be there. But we ought not be prideful to the point of where we can admit no wrong. We make mistakes, but our mistakes don't have to define who we are. It's what we do with that mistake that, that reveals our character. David made a mistake. He was a very imperfect man, but we see a picture of a heart of a man, a warrior, a man's man, who handles that mistake. This defines his character. This last week, I had a, an experience with a young man, or two weeks ago. I had an experience with a young man uh, who I love dearly. A very close friend. Um, this young man is 18 and he made a mistake. He had my daughters in the car with him and he did 80 down Old Town Road. And I found out. And so he came back to my house that night and uh, because there was a group of them hanging out, came back, dropped the kids off and uh, he's out in the car. It's raining. It's 11 o'clock at night or 10.30 or something. Now, that's late, so I'm in my jammies, right? Gabe, I got these full, they're footy jammies. It's this full onesie thing. <laughs> He's just sitting there going, dude, that's wrong. <laughs> I have my jammy pants on. I'm ready for bed, but I'm waiting because we're going to have a conversation. I walk out to this young man's car. It's raining out. I'm barefoot, just jammy pants, and I got an umbrella. <laughs> and I bend down by this window. He rolls it down, and he's like, what's up, Pastor Bill? And I was stone cold dead serious. I said, are you kidding me? I trust you with the lives of my daughters, and you do this? And, and these kids know me very well that I, I, I like to have fun. It was like the blood left. I don't know where it went, but the blood left their face, especially this, the one driving. I'm like, are you for real? I trust you with their lives, and this is what you do? And the conversation went a little longer, and then I said, drive safe. And I went in the house and they left. I was very upset, because my kids don't get to ride with just any 18-year-old. I trust this kid. He leaves, the night goes on, next day goes on. I'm that evening in my garage working on my car, so I'm just, you know, greasy and messy. and. Um, Melanie and the girls were out in the boat, and um, so I'm just there, and all of a sudden, come walking in, my garage, is this young man. And listen to this, he comes walking up, and I heard something, so I turn, and there he is, he's standing right there, and I stand up, I say hi, I greet him by name and everything, I'm like, what's up? I'm fine, I mean, we had our conversation, he knows they're just never riding with you again, because I don't trust you anymore. And he's standing there and he couldn't even speak. These tears are flowing. I mean, it's his face, you could just see the remorse. His, his, I mean, he was quivering. 
this kid was in pieces standing in my garage. And I just stood there. Because right then, that's the lesson being learned right there. You want to talk about awkward silence for him? I'm just standing there. Mm, soak that up a little bit. And then finally I said, so, been a long night, long day? I mean, he was a mess, you guys. He was a mess. And finally, after a little bit of time, he was able to get the words out about how sorry he was and how he knew that he broke that trust and how much that meant to him that we trusted him and, and on and on and on. And I listened to him. It's not the mistake that defines who we are. It's how you handle the mistake. What you do with it, that's your character. And I stood there and I said, you know what? I said, I kind of expected that this was going to happen. Because this is the kind of man that you are. This kid loves Jesus. I mean, he loves God. Unbelievable. He is a great kid. I, I love him so much. I mean, so much. And that was the picture of his character. He made a mistake but he handled it right. There are too many of us that sit in church week in and week out, especially as men, having made mistakes that we let dictate who we are instead of just handling it with the godly character that's inside of us. You guys, what we do with it, that's who we are. What David did with it here, he revealed his heart. He made a mistake, huge mistake. But he handled it. Be humble. Understand something clearly. You can be a man's man. And we need you to be a man's man, especially in the church. We need you to be. You can be strong. You can be courageous. You can be bold. But at the same time, you can be filled with humility. Amen? Finally, the third person, just to wrap this up real quickly. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Just a couple of verses here, but the third person I want to talk about is Paul. Because here's what I want to leave you guys with, again, especially you men, but this fits for everybody, is this. God has a plan for you. The question is, is will you accept that plan? Will you accept what He wants you to do? Or will you let your past... Will you let your mistakes, will you let your flaws dictate what you do or don't do? See, here's the thing. There are bad people that are sitting in this room right now. There really are. The worst person in this room right now, I want you to know this, that God has a plan for you, and I believe that God will use you, and He can use you. And that's what I love about Paul right here. You guys understand who Paul is. Paul was around right when the church was getting going in, in the early church. You read the book of Acts. Paul's around and the Bible says that Paul went around and he persecuted the followers of the way. That's what they called Christians. People that followed Jesus. They were followers of the way. And, the, and Paul says, the Bible says that Paul persecuted them. Women and children, men, even to the point of, of death. When Timothy, you read about Timothy in the book, or I mean uh, Stephen in the book of Acts, you read about him getting stoned to death. Paul was there. Paul even says that, I was standing there, I gave approval. This is who Paul was. This is what he did. He persecuted the church. But then, he met Jesus. Met him on the road, and Jesus just transformed his life like he has done many in this room. But here's the thing, Paul could have said, Jesus, I believe that you're real, I believe that you're there, but I've done too many bad stuff. All I'm going to do is I'm going to sit in church, I'm going to sing some songs, I might raise my hands, I'm going to listen to Pastor Bill Todd, but that's it. Because I've done too many things. I've done too much bad stuff to, to be used. Paul could have done that. He could. And I think he would have came here too. It's a cool church. I think so. But Paul chooses to accept God's plan for his life. Listen to this. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. It says this. Uh, here is a trustworthy saying, and this is Paul writing to Timothy. He says this, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, which is a good thing, amen? amen? Of whom Paul says, I am the worst. 
But for that very reason, because I am the worst, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on Him and receive eternal life. God shows this mercy to Paul, the worst of sinners, so that you and I, who might come to believe on Him, will understand the full extent of that grace and mercy that Jesus has. The worst of sinners. Christ, Christ Jesus might display His unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on Him and receive eternal life. Here's the thing. I believe that God has a plan for every single one of us. I believe that God wants to use us. And I get so frustrated when I know and I hear that because of mistakes that somebody made, that they're not willing to accept what God wants for them at this point. You guys, some of you have no idea the journey that it's been for me to get to this point in my life. The journey that it's been for so many others to get to the point where they're a pastor, or where they're a CEO, or where they're a politician. Hey, here's the deal. If God's calling you to be a politician, you're a believer, and you can do that with strength and courage, don't back down from that. Because we need godly politicians. Amen? Amen. Now, don't go into that until you come talk to me. We'll talk. We'll get everything in order. Then you can go and be a politician. No, I'm just kidding. You guys, what is God asking you to do? Young and old, men and women, what is God asking you to do? And are you willing to accept it? To step out with strength and with courage to do what God is asking you to do like Joshua did. To mix perfectly with that strength and courage, that heart after God like David's that's filled with humility, that's not afraid to say, man, I screwed up. And to accept whatever it is His plan is for you. Man, we need men to step up and do that. Amen.